This video is brought to you by Atlas VPN. Hannibal at the gates! Uh, wait, hold on a minute. Who the heck is that? Oh, that's Netflix. Netflix at the gates! Hello, noble ones and Netflix. Of course it's Netflix. I mean, <laughs> what did you expect? Historical accuracy. <laughs> First they knew Cleopatra was black because grandma said that. Then I suppose grandma also said that Hannibal was black. What else did grandma say? Emperor Augustus? Goodness gracious, don't give them ideas. I'd like to begin by saying that I'm a huge fan of Denzel Washington and I watched and enjoyed all Equalizer films. Very fun. So when you come to Mr. Washington's acting skills, I'm sure he would do a great job in the role of the Carthaginian general Hannibal Barker, Carthaginian being the source of possible controversy. Uh, well, in his age as well, because I mean, Hannibal was 26, CGI I suppose. There are several people that push the idea that Hannibal was indeed black as a historical, undeniable fact. So by making this film, Netflix is taking a stand with the wrong people. And mind you, these are usually the same people that say that if you disagree with them, you are a racist and a white supremacist, and you should stay silent. And silent, we shall not stay. And when I say people, let me make this painstakingly clear. By people, I do not mean black people. I have quite a few subscribers who are black, massive shout out to you guys and girls, thank you so much for your support. By people I specifically mean those unprofessional and non-academic individuals that are motivated by either hate or political agendas, or both, that try to use coercion tactics in order to force their worldview against the very principles of freedom of speech and academic debate, which are the basis of a free thinking society. So, if you're black, just know that I'm not attacking you, and my very purpose and message here is that black people do not need white charity when it comes to historical characters, history as a whole, and civilization. I say this because I occasionally see under these videos comments of people that say that black people never had a civilization or never achieved anything historically. I disagree with that, I do not support such stance. Alright, let's have some fun. This whole situation with Denzel Washington being cast as a possible Hannibal Barker has become a very hot topic, which has sprouted a veritable cornucopia, if not a swarm, of incompetently written articles. Now, mind you, this is not one of those videos on this platform where I just read the articles piece by piece and debunk them. This video is instead a deep dive of cultural, archaeological and iconographic evidence to support a thesis while discussing the opposing thesis. Still, just give me 15 seconds, will ya? Because I just want to show you a couple of things, just to warn you of what's out there. I swear, these articles expand like zerg. We go from articles that don't even mention the fact that the actor in question is black, pretending not to see it, to articles that complain about the actor choice, understandably, but then they don't even know who won the freaking war. Spoiler alert, the Romans. Also, allegedly, Hannibal was, quotes, riding a North African war elephant, close quote. Now, I get that the person who wrote this article probably only knows that Hannibal was coming from North Africa, and given all the other elephants in the army were probably North African elephants, but his own elephant was actually most likely Indian in origin, and it was nicknamed the Syrian, so there is that. I need a drink. They know nothing. Now, let's review all of the evidence together and examine it with reason, logic, and academic understanding. Okay, so where do the people who try to push this idea that Hannibal Barker was black get their information? What is it based on? Well, all of this stems from one specific finding. This coin, or should I say coins? Yeah. So let's talk about these coins, shall we? The first thing you'll notice when you'll examine the information presented by the people who push this coin as an evidence of it being a true representation of Hannibal's look is that they never tell you where the coin comes from, who made it, what period it's from, what the historical context was when it was made, what proof they have that it actually represents Hannibal's true features as opposed to what we normally imagine. They don't tell you about the weight, they don't tell you about the material, check it. But on this video, I'll tell you everything there is to know about this specific coin, including the weight, because, believe it or not, the weight itself is a huge indicator to its origins. 
This coin dates to the Roman era. On the surface of this coin we see the image of an elephant with a golden bell on one side and the face of what clearly is a black African man on the other. Of course, when they try to present this as a true representation of Hannibal, they also say that it's a Punic coinage. That is pure, baseless speculation. What evidence seems to suggest is that this coin is not of Punic origin, it is in fact Etruscan. So the reality is that this specific coin, of which we have several samples by the way, is not Punic and most likely does not represent Hannibal Bark at all. So who does it represent then? Now on this video I have a lot of interesting information to share so make sure to watch until the end. We will review several theories and discuss the pros and cons of each theory. You'll love it and I promise you that. As we always do on this channel, the moment we try to validate a piece of information, and specifically when it comes to uh, material goods or something in connection with the archaeology, we try to cross-reference it with other disciplines. In this case, we're going to start from literary evidence that mentions the coin. The first reference to this specific coin with the head of a black gentleman with an elephant is in a letter written by the erudite Reginaldo Sellari, dated to the second half of the 8th century. In this letter, the place of the original finding is indicated here in Italy, in La Val di Chiana, specifically in the fraction between the regions of Umbria and Toscana, including the towns of Arezzo, Chiusi, Cortona and Lake Trasimeno. If by the end of the 1700s that numismatist, that's someone who studies coins, Joseph Eccol, in his Doctrina Numerorum Veterum, had generally mentioned, without being fully convinced, that according to some the coinage were of Punic origins, already Sellery had correctly attributed the coin to an Etruscan origin. The way he did that was thanks to the following letters, which belong to the Etruscan alphabet. These are letters that appear sometimes under the elephant's stomach. On a first glance, they were interpreted as the initials of several hypothetical urban centers, although they are probably just the initials of the makers or their workshops. The coins, of which today about 40 specimens are known, are made of bronze and weigh about 5 or 5.5 five grams each. The style is homogenous, and even though usually differences in printing may be an indication of different mints, in this case, the issuing center was the same. Now, if you found any of this interesting, well, there is much more to come, as we will see after a brief word from the kind sponsor that made this video possible, Atlas VPN. Now, if you're like me and you like to surf the internet looking for interesting historical information, it's a great idea to do it in safety, which is why you should totally use today's sponsor, Atlas VPN. A VPN is a virtual private network that makes all of your internet traffic travel through an encrypted tunnel, and this way it protects you from spying, public Wi-Fi dangers, it hides your IP address and online activities. Atlas VPN is a great choice because it was developed by cyber security specialists, and among other things, it gives you access to the data breach monitor, which is a security feature designed to track any data breaches related to your online account, automatically scanning any leaked information. But another add-on through Atlas VPN is the fact that you can use Netflix from any countries regardless of where you are. So let's say that you wanted to watch a show that is only available in the UK but you live in America. No problem, just change your country through the VPN and boom, access granted. I always have Atlas VPN active on my machine, so that is because one account lets you use multiple devices. I personally really like Atlas VPN not only because it's a great choice, but also because it's really affordable, and that links to today's special offer. Get the Black Friday price cut, that's $1.70 a month for 3 years plus 6 months for free. If you've been considering getting a VPN but you weren't sure about the prices, then now is the time. And don't forget to click the link in the description. That's $1.70 a month for 3 years plus 6 months for free. Keep in mind that this is a time limited offer so be quick and click the link in the description. And big thanks to Atlas VPN for sponsoring my video. So as we continue to try and frame this coin correctly, both on its origin but also on what it actually is trying to represent, we need to also try and look at the image of Hannibal as a light-skinned individual and trying to understand where it comes from, in order to make sure that that's also not an incorrect positioning. So let's first look at the famous bust of Hannibal found in Capua. It is important to say that the attribution of this bust still remains under discussion. 
Was this really Hannibal? Difficult to say. There are unfortunately no extant autobiographies of Hannibal or Carthaginian works on Hannibal, which has resulted in a historiographical bias. However, we can have very strong inklings on what Hannibal would have looked like when we examine the rest of his family, which we do find represented on the Spanish Carthaginian coins issues. Immediately, we can see how these representations strongly negate the interpretation of a black or sub-Saharan Hannibal, as we see faces and heads which are clearly of a different phenotypic variant, most likely Semitic in origins. And differently from this coin, these are Punic mints. Who better than them? So, if interpreted correctly, this is Hannibal, this is his brother Hasdrubal, and this is Hamilcar the father. So based on these coins, why should we believe that Hannibal looked like this if the rest of his family looked like this? Archaeology has demonstrated, beginning from osteological analysis, the presence of black or mixed individuals within Carthaginian society. And this was not only the case for the regular population, but also among the nobles or the upper class. Look at, for example, the study conducted by Eugene Pittard of the remains of the famous sarcophagus of the Carthaginian priestess. So you could absolutely be black and Carthaginian and be a nobleman. The only problem is that it doesn't seem to be the case in this specific instance, namely the Barker family. Which statistically makes sense since the majority of individuals would have been of Semitic origins because the Phoenicians were of Semitic origins and came from the Levant, as I discuss in details on this video, link in the description. And as a confirmation of that, let's jump into the sources. Theodorus Siculus in his histories, as he tells us about Agastocles' expeditions in Africa, he says, then capturing another city called Felline, he forced the submission of those who used the adjacent country as pasture, men called the Afodelodes, who are similar to the Ethiopians in colour. So, if he felt the need to single out the inhabitants of this specific town, namely Felline, which is in modern-day Tunisia, as being black, so looking like the Ethiopians, it also means that the rest of the inhabitants of that region, including Carthage, were not black. Otherwise, it just would not make sense to single these out, just as a matter of deductive logic. Still on the Carthaginians, we can find more proof of this as we read Frontino. Check this out. Gelo, tyrant of Syracuse, having undertaken war against the Carthaginians after taking many prisoners, stripped all the feeblest, especially from among the auxiliaries who were very swarthy and exhibited them nude before the eyes of his troops in order to convince his men that their foes were contemptible. So, the characteristic of the auxiliaries that were hired and worked for the Carthaginians is that they were swarthy in complexion. In other words, the Carthaginians hired black warriors to help them as auxiliaries. So these were most likely conscripts from those sub-Saharan communities that lived in Tunisia at the time, similarly to the Asfodelo di Diodorus talks about. And before people's blood starts to boil, when I say Sub-Saharan, I only mean it as a way to indicate a phenotype. I don't mean it as a geographical barrier, I know it's not a geographical barrier, it's something that a lot of Afrocentrists bring up, and I actually agree with them on that one. In the Iron Age, in the Bronze Age, the Sahara Desert was not a barrier and it did not look anything like it looks today. Now back to the coin, and let's jump into the first theory. Towards half of the 19th century, the numismatist Raffaele Garrucci proposed a possible relation between the coins and the war between Rome and the Greek king Pyrrhus, beginning from the characteristic ear shape of the elephant. The small ears would make it look like it's belonging to the species Elephas Maximus. So the Indian elephants, which were captured by Ptolemy II of Egypt and then given to Pyrrhus for his Italic campaign. All other elephants used by the Carthaginian army would have belonged to the species Loxodonta africana pharaonensis, now extinct. Now, the elephant species part is absolutely correct, but the rest of the theory is now considered to be obsolete, however interesting. The reason being that for it to be logical, then the coins would have had to be minted in southern Italian facilities instead of Etruscans. And that is because with their general weight of 5.5 grams of bronze, they would have been too light if compared with the bronze coins issued by production facilities around the first quarter of the 3rd century BC. 
In the 60s, the numismatist Francesco Bambini Rosati proposed a new interpretation. The coins would have been in fact connected to something that happened specifically during the First Punic War, when the consul Cecilius Metellus defeated the Punic warlord Hasdrubal Barca, right here in Panormus in 251 BC, effectively capturing the Carthaginian elephants and bringing them back to Rome in triumph. Unfortunately, this theory is also missing context and it was rendered obsolete already in the 19th century by Babylon, since it would be strange that they would make a coin in Etruria to commemorate a victory which happened in Sicily, not to mention the Asiatic traits of the elephant which would not be accounted for. Already in the first half of the 19th century, the numismatist Pietro Tessieri and Giuseppe Marchi had suggested that the coins with the elephants and the face could be connected with the invasion of Italy by Hannibal. And this hypothesis was subsequently readdressed in the 60s by Stanley Robinson, giving some historical basis to the theory. In the 27th book of the Ab Urbe Condita, Livio remembers how in 209 BC Etruria started to garnish anti-Roman sentiment, with a certain number of rebels belonging to the city of Arezzo. The proprietor Caius Calpurnius was sent to ensure the rule of law in the city, and in 208 BC, with the ghost of a possible alliance between Hannibal's forces and Asdrubal's troops, the situation became critical, to the point that the proprietor Gaius Terentius Varro occupied militarily the city with two legions, forcing the aristocracy from Arretium to send 120 hostages to Rome. Levy tells us that all of these aristocratic men who were clearly anti-Roman and in fact pro-Punic rebels fled the city of Arretium and all of their goods were confiscated by Roman authorities. So these coins would have been minted in Arretium under order of a pro-Carthaginian sedition aristocrat used for anti-Roman propaganda purposes. Most importantly, the main purpose for these coins was to provide a stipendium, so to pay the Punic mercenaries. Okay, so if that's the case, then what does this face represent? Well, the face of this black gentleman could represent three possible things. It could be a Melano Gautilo, an Asfodelodes, or it could be representatives of some of the Punic troops, mostly auxiliary, of the time. And indeed, the Indian-looking elephant could be a reference to Surus, which was the Syrian special elephant of Hannibal, to represent the leader of the army. Now, although intriguing, the thesis presented by Robinson is indeed not perfect and does present some weak points that should be discussed. Even though the historical contextualization seems perfect, we still have doubts on the iconography itself. Why would a coin representing Hannibal Barca show an individual with these specific phenotypic traits? And why did they choose the one elephant which would have been atypical within the Punic army? Also, considering the fact that the very coins minted by the Barca themselves always represent elephants in the African variety instead. And these coins would have been very well known in the Mediterranean basin. In reality, it is very possible that even though we could place this coin in the last quarter of the 3rd century BC, perhaps its minting has nothing to do with the Second Punic War and could be instead connected to the Hellenic world. You see, something that it's important for you to know is that the Asiatic elephant is a recurring symbol on coinage within the Seleucid Empire as a symbol of high nobility. And coins with sub-Saharan heads are indeed present within several Greek mints, such as in Delphi, Phocia and Lesbo, already starting in the 6th century BC. So it is my opinion that the black face that we see on this coin is in fact a representation of Delphos, the mythical founder of Delphi, according to Pausania, son of Apollon, and the nymph Melaina, which literally means the black. Now, we shouldn't be surprised by the attribution of the founding of some Greek cities to foreign lands. Just think about Cadmo, founder of Thebe, son of the king Agenon of Tyro, so a Phoenician, not a Greek. It is in fact often the case that the mythical founding of several cities in Greece are often connected to exotic characters, also in connection with the Minoan and Mycenaean world. And sometimes these are also projected in the Near East and Egypt. So, according to this specific theory, the mysterious Etruscan coins of the Val di Chiana would have less to do with Hannibal and instead more to do with the celebration of some sort of festivity in connection to Apollon. In this next section, we will address another interesting perspective, which is the fact that whenever we try and propose this idea that perhaps Hannibal Barca was black, we also need to recognize that there is another established image 
what sort of validity does that image have? Of course, the simple fact that an image is established doesn't make it correct per se, but it's important to see how far back said establishment goes, as we weigh the possibility of it being real or fake, particularly when considering collective memory. This idea, instead of Hannibal being represented as Semitic looking or in general with light skin, is not something modern. It's not something that started to happen after 19th century racism or 20th century racist theories, but in fact it's something we can find on Renaissance art. And it is very possible that already medieval people also imagined Hannibal as a light skinned individual. So if this was some sort of manipulation in order to erase the real memory of Hannibal being black, then this manipulation would have roots that go all the way back to the Middle Ages and maybe even earlier than that. And to this I ask, why? I mean, Hannibal Baca was already perceived as the arch enemy of both Rome and civilization. If Europeans really hate black people so much, spoiler alert, we don't, but even if they did, when they started to change this image, why change it to a light-skinned person then? Hannibal being black would have been a perfect medium for sharing said quote-unquote hate. This is why the European white manipulation theory in this specific case makes zero logical sense. If Hannibal had won the war, maybe I could see that, but he didn't. No matter what you say about Hannibal Barker being a genius, a great tactician, a formidable foe, the Roman general Scipio Africanus outsmarted him, defeated him in open battle, Carthage being destroyed, Hannibal, as he's cornered by Roman enemy, decides to off himself with poison. That's the end of the story. Now, do we have all of the story and do we know every single possible detail about Hannibal? Well, unfortunately not. As I was saying, we only have biased reports from the Roman perspective and Greek. First, Silenus and Soilus were Greek writers who travelled with Hannibal in Spain and Italy during the war. Their works are unfortunately no longer extant. Second, the writings of Polybius and Livy, one Greek and one Latin, are in fact the most abundant surviving history sources of the Punic War in general. They wrote around a century apart, but the fullness and completeness of their works make them primary sources. That's what we have. And authors such as Cornelius Nepos and Plutarch studied Hannibal in both a historical and cultural context, making them useful for understanding and assessing Hannibal's legacy. Unfortunately, Polybius wrote his work from the victor's point of view. He was heavily influenced both by Roman patrons and his desire to show the Scipio's family in a good light. So the results of my research at the end of all this show a very different image from this. But of course, I welcome all constructive criticism. Do you agree with me? Do you not agree with the results of our research? But please let me know in the comments below. And if you manage to bring forth very strong evidence that in fact I am wrong and Hannibal Barca was in fact represented on this coin with his true features, if you manage to provide good evidence, I will say it. Instead, to all those who try to call me racist as a way to block legitimate discussion and try to cancel me, well, they can all go to hell. Or Tartarus, I suppose. Have a chat with Hades. Alright, noble ones, well, I hope that you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please remember thumbs up, and if you're not yet members of this community, become a noble one. Subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. Make sure to remember to take advantage of the amazing offer made by Atlas VPN by linking the link in the description. Thank you so much for watching, and remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.